So we have Tracy Fullerton, who um, wears many hats, as she described, but she is the, the chair and the head of the games program here at USC, as well as being an award-winning uh, creator and creative leader of many projects. And she'll go on to give many more details about her background. And we have Tessa Blake-Williams, who is both a writer and a director, and I think a producer of, um, of all kinds of uh, film and television and uh, shorts media, as well as the acting director of the AFI Women's Directors Program. She also does many more things, too. So, um, so we have quite impressive women here, and we just wanted to um, kind of start this project is, I mean, this project, this, this conversation is thinking about the future and about leadership, but just getting a sense of who each of these wonderful women are and talking about, you know, how they actually, their path to being the leaders that they are and the roles that they have. So, um, Tracy, how about starting with you? Oh, I get to start. Oh, I was just, yes. Uh, you know, I was thinking about it because you, you asked us about this uh, earlier. So I was thinking about, you know, how did it start? And, and actually for me, um, it started in my neighborhood. Um, and I was a really shy kid who had big dreams about making plays and movies and games. And so it meant going out in my neighborhood and convincing all the kids uh, to be in those projects. And that that sort of MO has followed me through my whole career, right? And so I, you know, I thought I was going to be a filmmaker. I studied experimental film. And right about that time, you know, there was this, this m massive change in the world of digital media and games. Uh, and so I diverted into that because it was, it was so incredibly exciting and unsolved, right? So every day could become a, a you know, adventure in solving unfaced problems. Um, and so I, I diverted into, into game design pretty quickly and wound up, uh, you know, becoming an entrepreneur and a game designer um, and working in some of the earliest uh, uh, internet uh, games, massively multiplayer games. Um, and, it, and really about sort of mid-career, decided to divert again um, and, and came here to USC uh, to what I thought was sort of double down and take um, my ability to, to um, create and sort of say, okay, well, what if I create creators? Then I can double down on the uh, effect that I, that I have in the industry. Um, and so, you know, that my, my career has been sort of a zigzag, I think, as you were, you were describing it. But, but in a lot of ways, it felt like a straight um, path towards uh, where I am, where, where my job is very much about creating creators. That's, Tessa, do you want to just talk about your background a little bit? And then sure. we can talk about what you guys actually do, too. Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so just a point of clarity, and I sound like a really fussy feminist, but my name is Tessa Blake, uh, Tessa Blake oh, Williams. Okay. I made his, no grubby hands on my last name, no. Um, my husband's name is Williams. I'm very fond of him, too. Um, I love that you started with the backyard. That's a great, I feel like I had the version for me was like, um, uh, they call it directing now, but they used to call it bossing your friends around. Um, and so I would boss my friends around and we would make stories and eventually that led to directing theater um, primarily I, um, and writing theater and collaborating in a lot of um, both kind of traditional storytelling for theater but then also more experimental versions. So I worked a lot with choreographers and I liked working with um, dancers and actors to pull out stories so to write collaboratively and work much more experimentally in different uh, form with theater. Um, and then, you know, when I got to New York and um, started to think about putting the pieces together toward a professional career, I worked with a theater company, Naked Angels, there. I am one of the early founders of The Moth, which is a storytelling event you guys might know about. Um, and I wrote a lot for magazines. I directed, wrote theater. And then at some point I was like, oh, adulthood. Um, how do you make money doing these things? How does that add up? And it's a complicated question because it doesn't add up um, instantly, particularly if your taste is a little on the experimental side, right? 
So I, the route took me toward um, being a writer for, with my husband, um, who is about to bring me a cup of tea, maybe? Okay, great, excellent, thank you. Um, and we became a writing team and we got very, very lucky and we got set up, we had a, a run of um, many development deals here. We developed with Warner Brothers and ABC and NBC and you know, this sort of slate of stuff. And, um, and that was great until I realized like, oh, no frame of film will ever get shot, ever. Um, we can write and our audience lives and dies in Burbank and that's not what I want to do. And so I had always been a director and I pivoted strongly back to directing um, recently and then running the directing workshop for women at AFI as uh, sort of a temporary interim post. Um, also, I love the idea of creating creators, that's great. But I feel very, very passionately about like storming the doors with diversity in the traditional media areas. Do you want to talk about just like what you actually do? I mean, I know you talked about the AFI, but like what other, what do you direct? What have you created? Both of you, maybe Tessa, just to... So I just got off set on a show called I, Zombie, which shoots in Vancouver, um, created by Rob Thomas, who did Veronica Mars. It's a clever, really interesting show that came out of a comic book. Um, so I'm an episodic television director, and that's, um, you know, fairly recent. It, it took several years to break that um, door down. Uh, the directing workshop for women, I'm an alumna of that program, and um, in a transition at AFI, they came to me to see if I would like to run it for the time being, and I've been very, very excited to participate in that, and also to innovate, and we'll, we'll talk more about this stuff later, but in, innovate opportunities for women and people of color to enter in the traditional media culture, and I'm really passionate about finding the partnerships that can allow for that. Um, and it's the thing I've been proudest of in my tenure there, which will be short-lived, probably the um, end of 2017, something like that. Um, but AFI is striving to find the way to connect the dots there, and I'm super excited to be a part of that. Wow, that's great. <coughs> I love how you put it, what you actually do. Um, uh, <laughs> I don't know, because, because it, you know, when, when you're like us and when you wear so many hats, you actually do all those things, just by the way, and it actually takes a lot of effort to uh, run an academic program. Uh, uh, but, but what I actually do is I'm an experimental game designer, and I, uh, I'm working on a number of projects right now. Um, uh, most uh, Primarily right now I'm working on a game called Walden, which is uh, uh, an open world uh, exploratory game in which you play Henry David Thoreau uh, at Walden Pond, and you you play out his experiment in um, in living, and and the game really set out to uh, uh, explore different goals than you might see in a traditional game, uh, to to really explore reflective play, so a kind of uh, play that relies on the experience of the player and not just on the game to tell you what the experience is, so the interpretive experience of the player. I, I, um, I'm also working on a, a console version of a game I made with the media artist Bill Viola called The Night Journey, which is a, a game about the spiritual journey, uh, and that, that should be released uh, next year as well. So um, that, you know, we have in our lab another five projects, but those are the two that I would say are my sort of um, babies, right? Those are the two that are, that are closest to my, my heart, and I, I uh, more executive produce uh, the other projects that are going on in the lab. And of course, I am nurturing and growing the USC Games program, which is a, a collaborative, cross-disciplinary program uh, in game design, which is um, you know attempting to create uh, not just game developers, but a, a new generation of, of game developers who are diverse, who are working in teams that are inclusive, who have good skills in bringing out new voices. Because you can't just say, let's just have everyone come and play and, and make games. You must have a space where that kind of um, diversity has a path to expression. Uh, and so that, that is something I actually do too. <laughs> I, I want to, when, when we met for a few minutes beforehand, I was saying that um, I want to acknowledge that, that both of these women and many women who are in leadership roles are some of the hardest workers I know ever. It's kind of unimaginable to me, but I have seen both of these women who, who work tirelessly 
Um, and I know it's rewarding to be um, to be in this position and to work like this. But it, it, do you you know just in terms of balancing your creative life and your and your um, and and the academic stuff you're doing as well as like anything personal? Is there any? I mean, I don't know. Is there any advice you can give or any thoughts you have? Because it really, I think people should know how hard that you guys work, and it's wonderful and be you know. Oh, when Stephanie said that to Bowl Tracing, I were like, yeah, we work hard. God. I don't know that there's any, I mean, I feel like, late, I mean, the joke I've been making lately is I feel like I'm in a door farce where I pop out with a new outfit and I'm like, I'm a writer, I'm a director, I run a directing program, I'm a mom, I'm a, you know, and so I don't have any, I don't find it possible to not work like this, which is a sort of a complicated, clunky double negative, but there are things I'm really, really passionately about, including making a living um, and being creatively invested in the work I do and innovating things that I hope make a difference for the future and being a human being, a good friend and a mom and a wife and the things I want to do in that sphere and mentoring people in a one-on-one -on -one kind of way. And I don't, I, I, you know, like you try to get enough sleep and exercise and eat okay. I mean, I don't think there's any magic to it, and but I don't, and I think actually, uh, you know, the pressure on me as a diverse director, and we'll get to the numbers of directing and television because they're abysmal, but they're not as bad as they are for film. But as a diverse director, you have to be the person who works the hardest. You have to be the person first on set. You have to be the person who delivered the best episode. You have to be the person with the best attitude. There's no, there's no room for me to be temperamental. There's no room for me to be less than excellent. There's no room for me to continue in my profession without being exceptional. <laughs> And the only way to do that is to triple down on everything. So I don't know if that's super depressing or inspiring, but that's been the reality of where I am now. I couldn't agree more. And I, and you know, I, th I think it's it's uh, one of the, you, you ask for advice, and I will say something. You know, you know, they always say, you know, if you want to get something done, give it to a busy person, right? So um, I don't have a problem with being a hardworking, busy person because I get a lot of opportunities that way. Um, but I will say that um, if you don't support a busy person, so if you don't give pe a busy person the resources they need uh, to, to, ba to, to keep that balance uh, you know, viable and sustainable, uh, then you, that's when you have a problem. And one of the things I find is that um, a lot of times as women leaders rise through the ranks, they are not automatically given the level of support uh, that, their, that their colleagues are. Um, uh, and, and what I found was that if I didn't ask for it, or if I asked for it too late, so if you don't know exactly when to negotiate for it, uh, then you basically wind up not getting it. And uh, no one kind of comes over and taps you on the shoulder and say, hey, oh, by the way, you know, you ought to have an assistant. Um, you actually have to have a breakdown in, before somebody's going to give it to you. And I think that is, um, you know, that's a real problem, but my piece of advice is know to ask, think about the resources you're going to need, make sure you get the resources that you're going to need, and don't always take the opportunities that come without getting the resources first, without getting those assured first. Because that is actually, if there's a mistake that I've made in my career over and over again, it's being so excited that I got the opportunities that I got because I was working so hard um, that I took on more and I did not assure myself of the resources that I needed to actually keep myself sane. I, and there's statistic support for this as well, which is to say like, if you, it's, it'll be no news to anyone that in the sciences, um, per capita, if you divide down, men are getting more dollars for research. But here's what's fascinating. They're actually literally getting more lab space. Like there's a the per foot, right? So even a parallel grant with the same amount of money, and you do, I mean, the only way to get work um, to break into television directing, which is like a great, you know, the great sanctified thing to burst into, is to ask and to ask vulnerably and specifically and thoughtfully of of people in your lives because how you get those first jobs. It's a tremendous amount of vulnerability, the asking. And I will say my gender experience is that it's tough as a woman to ask, to present with that kind of vulnerability. And it's the way that I've, it's the way that my career has really started to advance is just by asking. And being, and letting that moment 
be kind of empty and not filling it up with like, I mean, if that's too hard for you, no worries, you know, because that's my every impulse is to ask and then recoil and not make anyone else uncomfortable. And I think allowing other people to experience a like modicum of discomfort on your behalf is a very powerful thing. It's a very powerful vote for yourself. I, I I now have some things that I'm thinking about based on, <laughs> on that. I did, you know. I'm th I really I do need a lot more support, um, and 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 you're right. You know, being able to go and ask for things is is really something that's hard for everybody. Um, so how have to kind of take it in a slightly different direction, but building on that. So how how have you seen? The industries, I mean, related but different. Have you seen them change? Um, and you know, who is leading? Who was leading? Who's who is leading now? Like, what's happening kind of outside of you guys, who are wonderful examples? But what else is happening? Well, I, you know, I think the the game industry obviously has undergone a tremendous change in the last decade, right? So. Um, there's no question that the number of platforms, the business models, the uh, sort of the audience for games, the the perception of games, the genres of everything has changed, exploded, uh, and that's super exciting. And I can personally remember sitting, uh, uh, you know, in 2004, I guess when we established the Game Innovation Lab, uh, and we sort of threw down the gauntlet and said we're going to make, we want to create independent games. And of course, at that time, there really wasn't any notion of what that was. Um, I can remember thinking, this is going to be amazing. It's going to be like the, you know, it's going to be like the Haight-Ashbury of, of games, right? We're all going to be like, these, it's going to be free love and, and happiness. And uh, and it kind of for a while, th th there was this explosion of, uh, of that and, and new voices were getting on these new platforms and uh, getting to these new markets and getting these new jobs. And they were getting, they were actually making money all of a sudden. They were like, you know, all of a sudden superstars. And that was, that was so exciting, right? Uh, and then what always happens, happen, which is you started to see folks from the traditional games industry breaking ranks and going to those new markets, going to those new, sucking up those new dollars, right? And, and um, so there's this interesting shift that's happened where we had this explosion of possibilities and diversity and, and new voices, and then we have this sort of co-opting of, of that opportunity. And I think if you actually look at the numbers today, it's shifted, it's the, the, it is true that there are actually uh, more diverse people in industry and, and that needle is moving, moving slowly, but is moving. But it is not moving at the level of that 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 that, that explosion promised in those early years of, of of this independent games movement. So similarly, um, if we look at the, I mean, so a couple like tough numbers to start with. So if you aggregate the last thirteen years of um, studio film, so studio finance film, of the people who have directed them. 4% are women. Just take that in for a minute. 4% 4 per, 4 of all film over the course of the last 13 years. So there's not been a ton of change. Um, in television right now, for first time director gigs in television, which is the big threshold, your first, second, or third gig are the big threshold to break in, 83% um, of those first time jobs are given to white men, most of whom are heterosexual. So that's the first time job. Now, in theory, we're all coming from the same level of experience or inexperience as music video directors or independent film directors or gaffers or script supervisors or editors. And still, that first time job that should really reflect the numbers coming out of, I don't know, film school, for example, which are 51 to 49 in favor of women, it's actually 83% in favor of men. So the disparity is kind of breathtaking, right? Like it's, and it's white guys. So people of color are having a big challenge in our industry as well. Um, so how has the movement of the industry impacted that? Well, similarly, we had this, you know, huge revolution of the new media landscape, which involved Netflix and Amazon. And you do see in those landscapes where you know very noisy shows like Orange is the New Black or Transparent have made a big mark outside of the kind of normative paradigm. Um, and they haven't needed to have huge 
uh, numbers of people looking at the screen in order to sustain that because their business model is different. They have different platforms to sustain it. But you know, if you look at the full roster, like, you know, so we, we spend a lot of time thinking about transparent in Amazon, but transparent's budget is tiny compared to Man on the High Castle, which is $6 million an episode or more, $12 million an episode, I think, one of the hugest shows ever. Boring as paint drying, is my opinion, but um, <laughs> beautiful. Looks really good, um, and and that's a fu that's a fully kind of normative. I mean, it's an interesting show, but it's a normative show in terms of its representation, and more importantly, from my perspective, who's behind the camera and who's writing on the writing staffs there, right? So we can talk, we can like shine a bright light on the Jill Soloways and the Ava DuVernays and the Shonda Rhimes, and at the end of the day, where are the numbers going? Transparency budget's tiny. It's really tiny. Um, so that's fine, they're doing great things with that work, but I think it's always important to look at the kind of capitalist paradigm, and what we see is that every time the budget increases by $5,000, people of color and women fall out of that pipeline. So fewer and fewer creators are attached to things with larger budget figures. So in independent film, you'll see a lot of women, in film festivals, you'll see a lot of women, by a lot, I mean like 35%, let me be very clear. Um, but then by the time you get to studio film, you're at four. Right Now, film has had a radical contraction in the last decade and has been organized around blockbuster and franchise intellectual properties. Um, and that has been a very male-dominated genre in general. Um, and you know, one of the things I've worked with Fox at the Directing Workshop for Women in Fox has allowed our, it's a, and it's a first time ever, so it's a big noisy thing that's happening, which is that women will be able to work with the intellectual properties, the franchise properties at Fox, and make short films, right? So world building. Um, I, there's part of me that's like, or we could make big films, but short is good too. That's great. Let's start somewhere. Apple staff. Um, so our industry has frustratingly not expand, as it's expanded creatively, that has not been inherently inclusive if expanding in terms of diversity representation. But I think we'll see a change next year. I think we'll see it break the 20% mark next year. I think enough people are behind it in television that uh, we, and then we'll go flat. Everyone will forget the conversation. We'll be back here five years from now. I'll be like, it's been 22% for the last five years and nothing's changed. Yeah, and I think uh, I think programs like the one that, that, uh, that you're building and the one that uh, that we have are, to me, even if the numbers don't necessarily bear it out on the film side of things, uh, what it's kind of interesting in the in the games industry and in the interactive industry, there is a lot of opportunity beyond the studios, right? So the numbers coming out of programs like ours uh, are very heartening um, in terms of diversity. And my hope is that that means that as those folks move on and make their own opportunities um, that aren't necessarily connected to the larger sort of game studio models, uh, that that will uh, have you know sort of ripple effect into the into the industry. It's, it's why I do what I do, and and you know we focus very strongly here uh, at USC on that notion that our numbers are eventually. And the numbers of all of the programs that are similar to ours are eventually going to have a deep impact on, on the industry. This may be jumping the gun because we're going to talk about it later, but I think it's sort of come up now, which is to say, like, so, so for example, in film and television and in most industries, women have been at educational parity since 1969. By 1972, we were at full educational parity. We were graduating as many women in top of classes at the major institutions as men. And we have not yet seen in any single industry women penetrate more than 20% of senior leadership. So there's a massive gap between education and the highest level of the leadership in the industry. And I think, and we can maybe pause and come back to that to the end, what do we do about that is what I spend most of my waking hours thinking about, right? How do we compensate? How do we make the difference between education, which we're doing a great job with, and and bursting past 20% representation of color and women. So how, how, you know, given that landscape, how have you gone about getting your creative projects made? I have an answer for this one. It's the answer I've used since I was 12 years old, and that is, it's, I call it the Tom Sawyer method of producing uh, creative projects, basically, and that is I just start doing it, and I, 
make it look like it's so much fun to be doing it that everybody wants to do it too. And then we build, you know, in, in, in games and especially in sp experimental and independent games, you can't just write a script. You can't write a concept document and then someone's going to give you money. It just doesn't happen, right? Uh, first of all, there are f just no sources of money. But second of all, even those sources of money, the people judging it, evaluating the proposals can't, they don't see it. They don't, they can't grok what you're trying to do, right? So you have to build it. You actually have to get a team of people who are so passionate about the idea. You have to get them painting that fence. And then once you have a viable sort of slice of it, then you can go out and kind of do a little meta process of that with, with funders. And um, I've been actually really quite lucky. So the, uh, for example, the Night Journey Project and the, um, and the Walden Project are both supported by the National Endowment for the Arts, um, and the Walden Project is also supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities and has been part of the Sundance New Frontiers Lab. So um, what's interesting about that, though, is that we had a uh, vertical slice, which is like a, a very articulate uh, you know, first 90 minutes of the experience done before we ever got a dollar of funding for it, right? And, you know, it's... It's, it's really hard on people, but it's also, you know, everyone is deeply committed to it. So my strategy is kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, just jump in the pool. Jump in, get as much done as you can, articulate your vision as, as, as beautifully as you can, and then people will want to be part of that vision. Yeah, I mean, very similarly. So apart from the commercial work that I pursue and the trying to make the money to, you know, put dinner on the table, um, I'm an independent filmmaker separate and apart from that. And over the last three years, I've made three short films, a triptych of short films, um, all with female protagonists and in very different tone and genre. And um, I had this moment actually in the last film I did where I was standing in the middle of this like great loft space, the production designer had done a fabulous job reshaping and incredibly talented actors around me and this fabulous DP and I and I had a kind of momentary cold sweat because I thought, God, I thought of this idea on a train ride and here we all are, like 75 people later and, um, and it freaked me out a little bit, um, and, but also sort of like uh, the only reason people came on is because I was really, really passionate about it. Um, and I try to kiss her keep the humility of like, you know, I do what I do so that other people can do what they do. So the DP doesn't get to work on something unless there's um, somebody who's written something to work on, right? And the actors don't get to do what they do unless there's a script there. And so like, it, it, even though like you're the originator of it, it's been very important to me to sort of keep the humility of like, I'm just a part of this. I just do my part. And my part can be a little flashier on the back end, you know? because I get to be on a panel at the end on a film festival, but like the truth is I just do my part so other people can bring their talents to the table and then we all get to collaborate, right? And um, and similarly, so, you know, Indiegogo, I raise money for, for via Indiegogo, I raise money um, calling bigger to people who've been more supportive of my career and asking for bigger chunks the next time, but um, through a nonprofit, you know, I, I'll do a nonprofit umbrella with one of the places you can do that and um, I find that with more experimental work or shorter work, um, that's a good way to raise money because then people get the 501c3 benefit of it. It's exactly the same kind of path that um, myself and my colleagues have been on in setting this up and in hopefully creating a great platform um, and space for changing um, what kind of projects people see. And it's part of an ecosystem. I think that, you know, um, so many uh, of the early, you know, independent game designers wanted to be part of helping and supporting and starting IndieCade because it is such an important part of an, an ecosystem of independent media to have a place, a community, and a, and a festival to show the work in, right? So, uh, you know, prior to places like IndieCade, there were some smaller sort of, you know, um, less... But they, we were sort of ancillary. There were little ancillary uh, festivals to, to say, larger film festivals. Um, and then, you know, you bringing this together as its own community was a really critical moment in the ecosystem of, of independent games. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Glad to be here. Um, but 
It was when you were both talking about it. I was just kind of thinking about it and thinking about how wonderful we've created a space to kind of hear from from both of you about it. And and it also tied back into that kind of educational um, question that we had at the beginning where we're talking about like how does educating people or bringing people together to create um, these communities, like how, how in what ways are we able to empower, create change or, 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 or not, but like what, what is that, um, you know, what, what have been your goals in terms of like your program or, or your program? I mean, uh, so with the support of AFI, I have felt very strongly that the piece after your education is just so crucial. I mean, and it's so crucial for people who are not in the traditional pipeline, right? So my focus has been not just on my program, which is a relatively short program. It's a year-long program with a highly intensive four, you know, four, three to four week boot camp, effectively, right? So in my world, you know, it's all been it's been about like recognizing that the alumni of my program and of the conservatory are still basically under our umbrella, and it's our responsibility. And also it reflects incredibly well on us, right? So if we have a lot of women working in the industry, that creates more robust, you know, commitment to the program all the way around. So here's what, um, you know, Cheryl Sandberg and Lean In discusses this, and, and statistically it's true. Women are over-mentored and under-sponsored. So what does that mean, right? Um, and if you've had, like, you know, the 11 mentorship coffees, you kind of know what I mean, right? So what it takes to actually move meaningfully into the profession is sponsorship and sponsorship looks like this it looks like yeah he's great hire him i you know i'll take the hit here if this doesn't work out it's on me that's sponsorship that's meaningful advocacy that's what it takes and for whatever reason and i am not a sociologist and can't parse this um that has not been true for women and men of color. Um, we have not had that level of meaningful advocacy and sponsorship. So the question for me is like, I can, I can probably inculcate that meaningful advocacy for a woman or two or four, but that doesn't change the industry. What changes the industry? The change of the industry has to happen at a systemic level. And I do believe that programs, systematized programs, make a big difference. And I'll give you one example. So um, one of the issues with mentorship for women, like for example, in the financial industry, is that there's, there's a little bit of a concern around, you know, if older men are in power, younger women are coming up through the pipeline, what does it look like for an older man to take an interest in a younger woman? Not great, culturally, right? So mentorship in part has been a non-starter or sponsorship has been a non-starter because of sort of cultural impressions of what it looks like. So, you know, Goldman Sachs put into place a, a structured mentorship sponsorship program. And you know what? It changed things. Women advanced from junior to more senior executives because there was a structure from which the older man leader could be seen in the evening after hours at a restaurant with a younger female colleague without raising questions about what that transaction was, right? And then they got rid of the program. I mean, I can't, I really was like, great, I'm so glad it worked for two years. Um, so what we're trying to do is things that, you know, our industry works differently than that, but what can we do in our industry to create those pathways to, so, with the Fox program, it's true that one, two, or three women will make franchise short films, but the, the more important piece of it is that 40 women are spending a week at Fox like looking under the hood of the studio system. And what is it, what does casting mean? What does international financing mean? What is it, how do you put these pieces together? 10 women, after the 40 have been in front of panels at AFI, will go in front of Fox executives. So one, two, or three will get a green light but the rest of them, fingers crossed, they go into Fox 21, they go to Fox 2000, they go to Searchlight. They begin those relationships, those partnerships, and they don't have the gatekeepers of the agencies in the way because the agency, frankly, is part of the problem. Um, anyway, so for me, I think a lot about this stuff and how can I, in this fleeting position as the leader of a program, 
bring to bear a lot of guilt on the industry. How can I bring the numbers to them and say, you can do better, and you know what, let me show you an easy way of how you can do better. Let me show you the path to that. Like I just had a thing the other day where I was like, oh, right, that place has no women, but here's a way I can guilt them into doing it better, you know? And like that's what I do. I go around town, get studio drive-ons, and guilt people into doing better. <laughs> I love it. It's sort of the, you know, sister program to the Tom Sawyer method, right? Right. Um, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take your strategy of guilt. Uh, I've, I've learned something really good here. <laughs> you know, while you were speaking, I was thinking about how um, a program like what you're talking about might map to the games industry, and I started to realize something, uh, which I know, I, you know, I, I, I've always known, but but it, it, it brings it to, my, to the fore for me, and that is that so the game industry isn't about individual um, creative leadership. Um, it's always teams. Um, there is no director. Um, you know, there's a producer, but usually there's a pr producerial team, right? And we don't actually have the notion of a director uh, in the games industry. We we are we have dev teams. Dev teams are the stars. And um, you you usually think about a team, and there's a sort of when when a team breaks up, it's there. It's more like bands really, um, than, than it is like uh, individual recognized authorship. Um, and so, you know, maybe we've already naturally begun to do this, but in our program, a lot of what we do is we try to build little units that can go out and function. And so um, these hopefully are diverse units and um, they can, you know, sort of attack in different directions because it's a combination of skills, right? And and the most important thing is to make sure that when you form these units, when you help people to build these teams that they then take out into the into the industry, start their own companies, or become part of larger companies, um, that they are functioning in a way that recognizes all the individuals that are that are contributing to them. There's not one person, for example, uh, who is receiving more credit or receiving you know more opportunities than the rest of, of that team. But I think that's something maybe peculiar to the, to the software and games industry that we're not trying to develop individual talents. We're trying to develop members of teams and also to put those components together um, and then see those, those teams transition into the real world as either their own businesses or, or, or as parts of, of change within larger existing businesses. But one thing that might be parallel, though, is that uh, some of it is about networking and who you know. And often, I think people go to schools and programs to meet people that they'll know later. And I mean, I don't know if that's been important in your lives, but certainly in my life, that's how I met Tracy. You know, uh, you know, there's 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 people that you meet in that way. So I think. And I should say, too, that um, AFI on the conservatory side, the, the master side, is a highly collaborative program and maybe the most collaborative film school because there's six different disciplines. So it's writer, director, producer, production designer, cinematographer, and editor. So they're all in different tracks. And it, there's a high, high emphasis on how you collaborate. And those teams have really stuck together out in the world. You know. Um, a really notable AFI alums coming out of it. They keep their production designer, they keep their editor on board. You know that's a big piece of it. The Directing Workshop for Women is a short-term program focused on female directors. But collaboration, it's a little bit different in um, how it works as a television director because you're coming in as a guest. So it's less of a family structure. But we have a similar collaborative model in film. Or if you're a showrunner, you also do that too. So that, And I, you know, school is... Um, you know, most of my primary collaborative relationships, maybe not most, but many, come from my undergraduate education. And then I cobbled together kind of the film school in New York. I'm still tight with those people. And then going to AFI, like that, those are my, that's my team. You know, that's my team. And those are the people, like when I write the first draft of the script and I'm pretty sure it sucks, those are the people I'm getting it to, you know? Because they'll be loving but really honest. And that's huge, right? No, I mean, I. Stephanie mentioned that we, we met in, in film school here at USC, and, and also my, uh, my business partner and I were uh, sitting down in the front row of one of these classrooms when we met and shook hands and said, let's be partners, and then we were. And uh, you know, I got my first two jobs out of, out of school from 
alumni that I didn't know in school, but who were alum, uh, you know, like, okay, you went to SC, I know what you know, you're hired, you know, you don't, you don't get the job just because of that, and you certainly don't keep it just because of that, mm -hmm. but you get, you get to come have the conversation. Yeah, so as your programs are more diverse and, 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 uh, and have a, you know, kind of more inclusive student body, it just goes to, one would assume that it's going to impact the industry in that way, in a nice way. Well, again, I don't think we can assume that. Yeah. I mean, I'm really tough about this because I think we've had like 25 years of experience or more, 30 years of experience looking at how that hasn't changed things and how quickly alternative models and kind of insurgence of women and people of color in outlier pieces of the industry quickly gets co-opted by the primary industry and then suddenly it's kind of the same guys you saw before. So I think we actually have to be very, very careful and hold each other to a different model because the truth is, right, we, and we, this is a buzzword, but let's get behind it for a second, right? Unconscious bias, right? So I, I don't, I work in a liberal industry full of lovely people. I don't think anyone is attempting to keep me away from anything. I don't think there's some guy twirling his mustache in the halls of Universal saying like, no women ever. <laughs> I think they're all going like, oh my God, this is a terrible problem. What do we do next? You know, like they're distracted and the stakes are very, very, very high. The money's very high. They're personal jobs that will be lost, predicated on failure, right? So what do you do in that circumstance? You go with a known quantity. So the known quantities, and you also go with quite literally, there's something called the comfort bias. You'll see this all over, and I'll give you, I wish I could throw it up on the board. Um, Colin Trevorrow, who did Safety Not Guaranteed, and then Jurassic World, you know, and he went from a $750,000 budget to a $60 million budget. And um, he looks like Spielberg. They look alike. I'll put the slides, someday I'll send you the slides. Like, they look alike, right? And so when, you know, Brad Bird and Spielberg said, like, Colin reminded us of ourselves. I was like, yeah, I'm never going to remind him. I'm never going to remind Spielberg of himself. And he's a good guy. He cares about this stuff. He's very active in the industry. Like, he's meaningfully involved. And there's no doubt to me that there was unconscious bias involved in that. Because the same year, Ava DuVernay's film won Sundance, right? Now, Ava's had a really interesting path since then, but she had to make a second feature on her own independently you know, and then she got moved through the industry. She's very lucky. Like it's not, and she's very talented and she's very hardworking, right? And I don't think Colin Trevorrow's not those things, but, but he went from $750,000 to $60 million, a gap we've never seen a woman jump, a divide we've never seen a person of color. Well, Ryan Coogler, anyway, you know, there's some examples, but like it's, it's a vast appalling gap here. And I think we, the question of our frames and how we look at these things and how we structure these things and asking ourselves, holding ourselves to the higher question of like, not just the known quantity, not just the people I know, because the people you know are not that diverse from you, right? So there's, there's, um, there's, a, there's a tough question in all of this and it, it is not as simple as we have diverse programs educationally and so we'll see that reflected elsewhere in 15 years. That's too bad. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I've been really a downer. <laughs> totally like grumpy about the whole thing. We're going to fix it. We are. We're going to fix it. But we have to fix it really consciously. Like we have to not believe in easy answers. We actually have to commit to the tougher solutions. So, so speaking to that, like what, you know, I mean, you spoke to it somewhat, but like taking it a few steps further, what are some, some strat additional strategies that you know, where can we get to? How can we get there? Where should we be? I mean, I do think my guilt tour is, a, you know, I think there's a version that we can all do of that in our own lives of like, stop for a second and think about how we're casting something. Think about how we're surrounding ourselves. Think about it in our own uh, workplace environments. Um, you know, and, and uh, you know, Jill Soloway has a great thing where she says, you know, um, uh, 
Equality won't be when women are directing 50% of the things made. Equality will be if we could direct everything for the next 100 years, and <laughs> then we go halfsies, you know? So, um, so she's pretty tough about the whole thing. Uh, but I do think you, and she also has just said, like, I, all right, you know what? I'm hiring all women always, so fuck all y'all. Am I allowed to say that? Sorry. Um, <laughs> So that's her answer. I'm not sure that's my answer. I did, though, in that last film that I referenced, look around and thought, like, oh, all of my keys, so the production designer, the cinematographer, or the editor, my producers, um, everybody who is leading a department was female. No, I hadn't intended it, um, except for the script supervisor, a very traditionally female role was held by a guy. Um, and it was a night. It was really nice. It was really nice to work in a set that didn't feel like a typical set. Or um, anyway, so I don't know. I think we have to. I think that the additional strategy, like when when you have a platform, use it. When you have an opportunity to talk about this stuff, talk about it. You know, reflect it back. Like talk about the statistics. Like now you guys know four percent of films over the last thirteen years have been directed by women. People don't know that. That's kind of meaningful to know. That's important to think about. Yeah, I mean, I think Tessa brought up something really interesting earlier about the money, right? You know, so we can, uh, obviously, we can do all the touchy-feely work that we want here at USC with the, uh, you know, creating all these inclusive teams and, and it's, and it, it, you know, trying to help bridge those folks out into the industry. But if when they get out into the industry, uh, there's no uh, investment, there's no, uh, you know, commitment to funding them and their ideas and their games at the level at which the uh, sort of more traditional teams are funded, then then they're screwed. Now, I, I do think that we've seen some uh, kind of interesting forays into to maybe big companies following on this guilt uh, principle, right? So we, we've seen Intel make some, some big moves in, in, in the industry, for example. Um, and I think that's great. That's wonderful. But I think we need more. I think that you know that lasts for a certain amount of time and right now that's not about that's about directly funding um say students to go to gc and um uh you know creating networking opportunities but it isn't about funding their games right and so uh money is almost always at the heart of of the issue and so if we can if we have programs or commitments by large companies to fund Pro these the projects that are coming out of these these programs like ours, uh, then that could be some seeds of change. There's also uh, Franklin Leonard who runs something called the Blacklist, who's a real leader in thinking about um, diversity and change in our industry, and has created a structure that democratizes the possibility of writers advancing themselves um, through quality writing. And he's thought he he has first of all his Twitter feed's great, so just subscribe to Franklin Leonard's Twitter feed. All I do is retweet him. Um, and he's, he's had a couple of great quotes, including, like, I encourage all the women and people of color I know to act with the entitlement of a m mediocre white guy, I think is what he said. But, um, <laughs> which, by the way, is not really working for me. But um, I'll report back later. I like that idea. But he said something really interesting. Like, what, and all the white guys here are s exceptional and not mediocre, so I'm totally not dissing you. Um, uh, he said something really interesting. When we were talking, you know, we'll, we'll talk at long hours about, like, how do we get at this? How do we get at this? And, you know, I said to him, like, okay, so let's be, like, super dumb for a minute and, like, not try to fix it from the ground up. But, like, what's the one thing that would need to have changed for us to know change happened? Like, what's the thing? He said, you know, it's when you say the word director, a different image comes in your head. Right? So when I was a kid and you said the word doctor, a very clear image came to your head and it was a white guy. He was your doctor. And now when you say the word doctor, I think you think all kinds of options. You know, you don't have a definitive. When you say the word surgeon, there's still a very definitive image in your head, right? So Obviously, we can't go forwards to that. Like, I think we do try to change representations, like literally in graphics, and AFI is very careful about this. Like, in the directing program, we choose, and we have plenty of female directors of color, and that is who is on the brochures, because we want to encourage 
seeing this differently, literally, visually seeing it differently. So we can't get at it necessarily from the top, though we can try. It seems a little superficial. But I just think of it as an interesting litmus for all of us when those words, when gamer comes into your head, game designer comes into your head, what does that look like, right? And, uh, and I hope next time we're talking about it that that shifted a little bit or shifted for some people a little bit. 